This is episode 113 of Secret Source, the restaurant marketing podcast, pub, club, bar, and hotel marketing for fun and profit, part two. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret source. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success, your secret sauce. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. It's James here from Marketing for Restaurants. And today we are finishing off on our conversation about pub, club, bar and hotel marketing for fun and profit. So last week, we discussed on some of the issues that you can have. We defined what a a pub is, and I'll continue using that term, just bearing in mind that we're looking at anyone who's got multiple activities, generally significantly larger than your average restaurant, lots of seats, lots of capacity, lots of rent, lots of payroll for wages, so lots of things that you need to think about to come up with a coherent marketing strategy. And um, that's where we sort of left it off. The fact that we, we delved into the issue that you don't have a unique selling proposition. So for a restaurant, it could be this is the best Chinese in town. Simple, clear, I grew up in Sichuan province and I've been cooking Sichuan food because I love it. It's super spicy. I want you to come in and try a little bit of the home cooking that I grew up with. That's a really effective, unique selling proposition. You can run that out to lots of people in lots of different ways. So you can market it to Chinese people in Mandarin. You can market it to locals, you can market it to tourists, you can market it to people who want gluten-free food, vegetarian, yada, yada, yada. Lots of things. We talk about this sort of stuff all the time. So that's sort of pretty clear cut. The issue with a pub though is that you have got possibly three different businesses, possibly six different businesses in the one location. So how do you come up with a coherent marketing strategy around that? And that is something that's very difficult to do. And, you know, there's a bit of argument about the best way of doing it. Some people like to have multiple websites depending on the focus of it. So you might have a live band room where, you know, you'll get a band in playing every Friday and Saturday night or every night of the week. You know, you might have a bit of quiet jazz one night, heavy metal the next. So you'll have a a one website for that. Now, I I think that that's probably going a little bit overkill because it increases the amount of, obviously, it costs more money. You're increasing the burden for the way that you're going to manage each of those pages because you want to have a page that's going to be uh, updated fairly regularly. Bands, this is one of the things that's absolutely critical with your website. You need to be able to get in and edit yourself. One of the big pain points that uh, customers come to us with is that their current web developer takes two weeks to get a change made on their website. And I just think, well, that's crazy. Why don't you do it yourself? Oh, we don't have the passwords to it. Well, that's even crazier. For something like live bands, as soon as you book someone, you want to be getting that up there. So you want to be able to manage that yourself and you don't because you don't want to be incurring any other costs for someone else doing that. It's not that hard. When you're using something like WordPress, it's pretty easy. You should be get a manual on how to update your the pages or, or get your, your developer to, to show you how to do those things. That's something that we run through with our customers when they want to make the changes themselves. We show them how. It's nice and quick and easy so that you can get that up. The more often you change your website, the more often Google's going to be going, wow, this is a happening place. There's lots of things going on here. Maybe I should be ranking them a little bit higher. Mm, Google ranking your business a little bit higher. That's something that everyone should be interested in. So let's just take a, a typical pub that's got three things going on. So they've got the band, they've got food, and they've got drinking. How are you going to segment that? Well, let's start with the restaurant part of the of the pub because that's, you know, that's the bit that everyone should be pretty familiar with. If you've listened to the podcast for more than a couple of episodes, then you'll have a pretty good idea about how we're going to do that. We're going to segment that. We're going to break it up into the kind of things that you do. So what kind of food is it? And is it your typical typical sort of pub fare? So in Australia, you know, you're talking a chicken parma, you're talking probably fish and chips chicken schnitzel there you kind of that's your typical sort of pub fare there'll obviously be steaks in there as well 
So, do you have your typical pub fare? Uh, do you have anything that's special about it? You know, you could have like a challenge thing, you know, one of these things, you know, eat our four kilo steak and if you don't die at the end of it and do it within 30 minutes, then we'll, you can have it free or we'll give it, put your name on, up on a board. Lots of things that you can do around that to make it a little bit more unique, a little bit more appealing to some people. But even just with that standard pub type fair, we're going to we're gonna segment it. So what's your unique selling proposition for vegans? So here's our vegan menu. What about for gluten-free? So here's our gluten-free thing. And you're going to tell that story specifically. And so I don't think this is not the thing that you want to have on your homepage. You might want to have it down the bottom in, in small text because a lot of people don't care about gluten-free. I'm one of those people. Don't have celiac disease. So I'm not really that fussed about it. It's not something that's going to make me want to go to a restaurant or to a pub. However, however, it is a much bigger question for anyone with celiac disease. Those people are, and we've said it before, they're likely to be recommenders. They're very picky with where they go. So you're going to have a page. You're going to have a page on the website that talks about, we've been cooking gluten-free food for 25 years because someone in my family's got celiac disease and I've been out with them and they've been disappointed or when they've eaten food where the proper handling techniques haven't been followed. That's why we have a dedicated part of the kitchen and I've spent some real time coming up with some really good ways that we can create gluten-free offerings for our customers because I want people with celiac disease to be able to enjoy themselves just as well as everyone else. That's the sort of standard gluten-free type story that we like to tell. Gluten-free beer, we're talking pubs, we should be talking gluten-free beer. One of those things, oh wow, really? And so gluten-free beer, uh, I'm not going to try that. But for someone with celiac disease, their story will go something like this. I was diagnosed with a celiac disease 20 years ago and I used to get terrible cramping, bloating and followed by really severe diarrhea. So since then, I haven't had any beer because of the gluten in it. Now, what are you selling when you sell gluten-free beer? Like to me, it's, I don't know, I'm not going to try that because I don't know, I don't know what they've done to it. But For that person with celiac disease, you're selling them the first beer in 20 years. You're selling them the first beer in 20 years. Uh, I repeated that because it's pretty damn important. How much do you reckon that first beer in 20 years is worth? And so I've been speaking to a couple of places that have introduced gluten-free beer and they get amazing feedback because people are like, this is so cool. What wouldn't you give to be able to sell someone their first beer in 20 years? I think I first heard about it about six months ago. I didn't know that there was gluten-free beer. Really powerful. We're segmenting up the food offering into its various components. What does it mean from a website point of view? You're going to have a, a part of the website that's dedicated to the restaurant. Now, you might have multiple restaurants, you know, so you might have the, the counter at the front, you might have an area at the back where, you know, it's, it's a different menu, a little bit more upscale, opportunity to charge a bit uh, higher price, make a little bit more margin. And then you may have a function room. That's something to think about as well, your function room. So you might have a third menu with that. Each one of these is going to have its own page, its own menu, and its own story, photos in there as well. You know, when you... I always talk about wanting to de-risk the transaction. So tonight I'm going out to uh, watch one of my friends do some stand-up comedy, and so I'm going to have a meal... And I've got a couple of places. I've got three places that I'm going to. So remember, like I I don't like going to, I'm not a regular anywhere. So I want to go somewhere new. I want to try something hip and exciting. I want to, you know, I want to be wowed. I've got a list of three of them because they either don't have a website or they haven't done enough to de-risk the transaction. So I've had a look at the menus and all of them meet the criteria for yes I would eat there some of them don't have websites some of them have only got a Facebook page some of them don't have anything I'm just sort of going off word of mouth recommendations but I'm quite likely they're all in a small location so I can go in have a look it will not even go in do a walk by and go nah I'm not going in here or this place looks cool I'm going to go in here de-risk the transaction people take a photo this is what our pub looks like if there's no photo of your pub then it's probably because it looks crappy 
you haven't de-risked the transaction. So in my mind, I've got all of these things. Oh, it's probably awful. There's probably like drunkards sitting there and, you know, it's one of those places where the carpet like is all oozy from beer that's been spilt and hasn't been cleaned up in, in a week. If you haven't done anything to dispel the thinking in my mind that you're probably going to be in the next season of John Taffer's Bar Rescue, then you're probably, in my mind, you probably need to be on the next season of John Taffer's Bar Rescue. De-risk the transaction for me. This is it. Oh, wow, this place looks really good. The food looks great. You know, it looks like a nice clientele that they have in there. I would be happy to eat there. So... There's a portion of the website that's going to be telling a segmented story about the food offerings that you have. Now, on to beverages. What is it that you sell? It could be a standard set of beers and a few, a couple of house wines. What is there that you can do to spice that up a little bit? What are they from? Are, are they from local wineries? Do you have someone with a bit of wine knowledge who can, you know, come up with some tasting notes? Do you want to start pairing them with some of the dishes? You know, what would a classic? What's your house Shiraz? What does that best go with? What are the ways that you can sort of? You know, flights. Flights is an easy way. You know, even beer flights. You know, so yeah, we've got three local breweries in our town and we don't like to pick favourites. So come in and get the Our Town flight and we'll give you, you know, three beers. You can taste and we want you to make the decision. Or, you know, uh, it could be a vertical. So, you know, a a pale, a mid-strength and then a dark beer from the same brewery. Lots of ways that you can spice up the way that you're selling the beverages within your establishment. And of course, don't forget happy hour. And as I've always said, happy hour doesn't just have to be around drinks. It could be around food. But lots of things that you can do from a happy hour point of view to try and drive that transactional value. Now, the other thing that we haven't talked about, but now's probably a really good time to start thinking about it, is the day. How does your business go across the day. And I think we've looked at 24-hour restaurants a couple of times, not in great detail, but we've talked about them a couple of times. One of the great advantages of a 24-hour restaurant is that they can spread their costs across, uh, so leasing costs. So let's just say, just for a random number, you're paying paying $21,600 in lease per month. That's pretty high. You want to be getting a few bums on seats to be able to handle that. Now, that's $900 a day. If you're open for three hours, that's $300 an hour that you've got to be bringing in to cover your lease. If you're open 24 hours a day, then it's $37.50. So you only, now, it's going to be hard to get people in at three o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And this isn't for everyone. It's only for a small number of people to run a 24-hour business. But, if you can, then if you make $37.5 worth of gross profit uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning, then you've paid the lease for that hour. And it means at 4 o'clock or you know, maybe 5 o'clock when the night shift people start uh, coming through, then you're going to be getting that little bit. You're already at break even. So as you start to ramp up, your lease is going to be very low as a as a component because you're paying it per hour and you're across 24 hours as opposed to a place that's only open three hours. Now, for a pub, let's just assume that you're not going to be open 24 hours, although you almost could be if you've got late night into three o'clock in the morning and you haven't got crazy lockout laws in like places in Sydney have. So, you're going to start off with your morning trade. Now, in the restaurant, that means breakfast. In the bar, what are you doing around coffees? I saw a... uh, a pub that was trying to build up a coffee clientele, lots of people walking by, they're not thinking I'm going to go and grab a coffee, so they had a happy hour at 9 o'clock in the morning on, and it was $3 takeaway coffees. So obviously they're just getting them ready, smashing them out, ready to go buy, people are sort of handing over their money and going. That's a great way of, once again, earning that little bit of extra incremental revenue to pay down the lease. And when people are in there, obviously, if it, if it's um, if they're taken out, they're not going to be in there for a long time. But you've got the opportunity to expose them to in uh, pub offers, 
you may be able to have some way of collecting their ID, uh, their email address. Lots of things that you can do there, but happy hour for coffee in the morning. That's the kind of thing that you want to be starting to think about. So you've, you've got your breakfast trade. How well is that going? And that is a fight that you want someone focusing on. Now, it may not be you as the, as the pub manager, but you want someone who is going to be thinking about, I want our breakfast menu to be as popular as possible. I want to get as many people in. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Once again, we're talking about the total costs over the day. If you can be open longer and profitable for more hours, then you're going to make more money. You know, that's a, that's a given. But there will be a series of people, if, if we look at the other end of the day, so your, your, your band night, they could be, let's just say it's going to be 18s to, you know, 30, 35, 40s. Those people may or may not come to your breakfast. The people who go to your breakfast probably aren't going to be the people who are going to go out drinking into the wee small hours of the night. So the cool thing about this is the fact that you are able to uh, get a different, you're able to access a different part of the market, a different part of the local market and get them in and give them breakfast. And they're going to say, you know what, I love the local pub because they do a really great Eggs Benedict. And they're going to be talking to someone who says, you know what, I love that place because they have some of the best bands. Like That place on a Thursday night completely goes off. Two different people, two different desires, two different products that you're delivering. This one end result, though, of happy repeat customers. And that's what you want to do. And this is the strength of of a pub, the fact that it's got multiple products that it can offer to different parts of the of the local market. Now, of course, the big challenge and where, where you can really double down on the profitability here is the cross-sell. So for someone who's in there with their eggs Benedict, do you want to offer them some sort of offer or give you know, even just let them know about what bands are coming in you know, send them out emails, all of those sort of things to get them to think about coming out to that. You know that they're in the area. So what would it take to get them to come out and to see a band? Now, let's talk about bands. So the music that you're offering. Some places, and we see it sometimes in restaurants where, you know, it's a good thing, the music that they have. Uh, Other times it's like, oh, could this guy shut up? Because I really just want to talk to people and the music is actually pretty ordinary. For a pub, usually a lot more thought goes into the the musical component that is being offered. So the tables get cleared away, the family meals are done. Once again, another niche that you're sort of targeting, the family coming out for their pub meal. And then, you know, the band will start kicking off, you know, late 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night. What is it that you're doing to do the marketing there? Now, obviously in the website, you're going to be having a list of all of the events that come up. Facebook, Instagram, big opportunities there. The other thing is that the band is going to be promoting themselves as well, generally. So they're going to be doing their own marketing. And this is a really good opportunity to sort of coordinate with them around how that marketing message is going to go out. Because there's a couple of things that are really big here. Firstly, is the band is going to have people who are going to come and see the band. You want to access that group of people to come in for a meal before they see the band. So there's an offer there that you can give to the band to give to their loyal patrons. The other component of it is that the band is looking for extra people to come and learn about their music and their performance. So what about the people who are on your email list who've never heard of this band? How do you get that story out to them? So obviously, on a website point of view, and we talked about this before, you want a website that's going to be easy to maintain. The band's probably going to have their own artwork that they can give to you. Can you marry it up with some online samples, you know, a link to their YouTube channel, something out there, maybe even iTunes sales, something out there so that people can get an understanding of what it is that they're going to be getting themselves in for when they do buy their tickets to come into the band, if there is a a cover charge or not. But that cross-sell opportunity is huge. You want people who are in the local area that haven't been to your pub to come in and try, you know, maybe a dish. Are you going to put on a special dish? You know, if it's a death metal band, you could come up with a series of death metal dishes. I don't know what they would look like. That's over to you, Blue Leader, to come up with some crazy ideas there. Is it a jazz night? 
what are some, you know, what are the jazz players' favorite meals? You know, we're working with the jazz guy and his favorite meal is this, this and this. It's from his hometown in Charleston. So we're going to cook these up specially. Big opportunity there to promote that. Make it quite the event. You're going to push it out to your existing customers. He's going to push it out. You know what? My favorite meal is this and I'm playing at my local pub and they're actually going to be cooking it. So I'm going to be there at five o'clock to get my favorite meal. You're welcome to come along. Um, We can sit down and and, and enjoy it. Now, that's the kind of thing that can work really well in building a community and it's that cross-sell that works so well. For a pub, club, bar or hotel, that cross-sell opportunity is really big, I think, because of the fact that you've got a bigger venue, you're going to be doing more of these events and you want to be accessing other people's marketing databases. So have a think about your brewers. What marketing power have they got? What marketing resources can you tap into to be able to run a joint marketing campaign around the beer? Same, same with wine, same, same with spirits. What is there that you can do? Suppliers. So I think that that's one of the areas that we see a big opportunity for a lot of pub operators to do, and that is to access other people's marketing databases. Now, why are they going to let you access their marketing database? And so for a brewery in Australia, we've got this big thing now with boutique uh, distillers. So there might be a place that does gin. All right, that's pretty exciting. What they might do is put up on Facebook, and they've got might have a big Facebook following. They're going to put up a post about a special gin degustation menu that you're that you're running, and then they might run an ad to it so that they can get more people, the people who like their gin, they think, wow, this is going to be epic gin pairings. Let's go along to that. Why would they do that? They're going to do that because you have got a marketing database as well. And remember, if you don't have a marketing database, then you just got to use Facebooks. You know, it's a massive database, super powerful. You know, you can find all of the people, you can find the number of people within 20 kilometers of your local area who like gin. You know, that's pretty easy to do. In fact, it's simple to do. So you can run that ad because what you want to do is you want to be seen to be sharing the load. People get a bit sick and tired when they run an event and all of the people who turn up to the event are people that they know are on their mailing list. It's like, you know what? So we spend all of this time creating this beautiful Malbec and not one new person was introduced to it. So we would, whilst we got the good numbers, it was okay. We didn't do anything to introduce any new people to our brand. So from a marketing point of view, this event failed. What you want to do is to bring along 50% of the people, hey, these are regulars from our pub, we're doing a Malbec night, and we got, you know, 100 people who are from our mailing list to sign up for it. Now, any winery or any winery that's good at marketing, they would kill for that opportunity because those people are going to, obviously, they're going to follow up at the end of the night, you know, so hope you really enjoyed it. Obviously, our um, our star performer is, you know, the, the 2015 Malbec. The exciting thing is we've got a special deal for everyone tonight. It's only, you know, $250 a case. And they might sell 10, 20, 100 cases of that wine, depending on the number of people that you get in and how good the, the Malbec was. When they can do that, they're looking at that and thinking, wow, we moved $25,000 worth of wine. I want to do this again. This has been a great night. Now, you don't want to oversaturate, but for them to be able to move 25 grand's worth of wine, that's pretty cool. That's the kind of opportunity that you want to be bringing to other suppliers because they're going to be much more likely to tag along, much more likely to do a joint marketing campaign with them. I think we've covered off on everything. Uh, just oh, just with the website, I think it's worthwhile going back to that. We've talked about events. We've talked about joint marketing. We've talked about you know bands coming in and playing. That sort of stuff changes quite rapidly. And so nothing says you know, dodgy establishment than, you know, hey, everyone, come in and book your your Christmas dinner with us, you know, so Christmas 2018. It's like, well, dude, that's already been. Do you guys even market? Like, obviously not. So I'm picking that it's not that good. A, th- these are the kind of things that people are going to be using as cues about how good the food is. You haven't even updated your website. That's a bit crazy. So you should be able to do it yourself. You should be able to, you know, update the, you know, roll through from, 
in Australia, you'd have Christmas, then New, Year, New Year's, probably going to do those both because there's not a lot of lead time between them. Uh, then Australia Day, Valentine's Day, then, you know, all of the other events that you've got coming in. Now, fun fact, I, I saw about this briefly yesterday, uh, so this will tell you what day I'm doing this. Friday, the 12th of April, was Grilled Cheese Sandwich Day. Who knew? Now, if you knew, then you could have come up with eight different types, you know, <laughs> a sampler of toasted t- cheese sandwiches. That would be epic. So we've got eight different cheeses. Come in, try them all. Here are the toasting notes. Oh, let's pair them with beers. That's going to be epic. I don't even know what a toasted cheese sandwich goes with. Let me Google that. So tomato soup, fries, Brussels sprouts, cookies. Oh, none of those ideas are any good. Okay, I just Googled what to drink with toasted cheese sandwiches. Classic grilled cheese with a Pinot Gris. There we go. And there's actually an article uh, on uh, how to do your wine pairing blue cheese and honey on rye with a Riesling, grilled ham and cheese with Gouas Tramina. Oh, this is, you know, easy to do. Oh, grilled, uh, a meatball grilled cheese with Chianti, bacon grilled cheese and Syrah. (laughs) I've actually talked myself into having this for dinner uh, tomorrow night. That sounds epic. Bacon grilled cheese and Syrah. Get on that. Now, this is yesterday's marketing campaign. So if you're hearing about it and thinking that's epic, schedule it for next year. Start the marketing planning now because it's, you know, it's never too early to start planning. If you cannot wait for bacon, grilled cheese and Syrah, I can't, I cannot literally wait for this. This is going to be epic. Uh, then what I would do is redo it. There's no law on this. The international grilled cheese sandwich people aren't going to come and arrest you for eating grilled cheese on a non-international grilled cheese day. Go for it. We are doing. We're we're celebrating grilled cheese sandwich day, and this is our seven course thing. Now, you know, trial it. Get the workflow right so that you can uh, that you can create them. Uh, you know, trial it with a couple of your regular patrons, and then put it up on your specials board. See how it goes. If people like it, if people are down for it, then put it up on Facebook and promote it like there was no tomorrow, and see how you go. This is one of those ideas that I literally just came up with then that I think could fundamentally change the difference, uh, change the profitability of a day. And of course, you're not going to do this on Friday when everyone's super busy and the kitchen's run off its feet. You're going to do this on Tuesday night or Wednesday night, your quietest night, and give people a reason to come in, give people a reason to try some some new things. And, you know, you, you're going to get new customers in, you're going to send it out to your existing customers, they're going to come back, you're finding new customers and you're turning them into repeat customers. A pretty cool idea, I think. So, we've covered a bit of territory. Pubs, big venues, bigger budgets, bigger number of seats that you've got to be thinking about filling. So, we've looked at really our approach is just segmenting. Segment the big events and then segment them a little bit further onto how you're going to do and then go with the cross-sell. Once you've got that, find out what's working for you. Iterate around the things that don't work for you to try and work out what it is that's not working. Is it the offer? Is it the demographics? Is it the uh, the timing of it? And for those things that are working, just really double down. The partnerships that are working really well, keep them going strong. The offers that are working really well, keep them going. And just keep an eye on it and test and adjust as you go through the year, working on what's keeping doing what the things that are working and the things that aren't working, drop them, slot something new in and try something new. You've got to always be trying something new, particularly in venues that are that big because people's tastes can be moderately fickle. That's about it. Hopefully you've got something in there that's going to be uh, useful to you. You have a glorious day. Okay, bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out 
marketingforrestaurants.com.